Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and I am here as part of our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Our guest this week is the wonderful Debbie Millman. She's the host of the podcast, Design Matters. We're going to be talking about why design does matter, and she has a new book to show for it. It is uh, eponymously titled, and it includes uh, interviews with some of her 400 plus uh, exceptional guests that she has interviewed on the show since 2004. Debbie, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Dory. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And for those of you who are tuning in and joining us, please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are, where you're dialing in from, and any questions that you have for Debbie Millman. So Debbie, the, the first the first question, you know, just, just to formulate it for people, uh, why, why does design matter? Why, why is this something that is relevant for everyone and not just design professionals? Now, you have excellent uh, bona fides in the design world, and you, in fact, were the co-founder of the Master's in Branding program at SVA, the School of Visual Arts in New York City. You have uh, had a, a lot of, of honors within the field. But for someone who is not a designer, why... Why are these things we should be thinking about at all? Well, design is intention. Design is deliberate differentiation and decision-making about everything, about how you want to live, what you want to eat, what you want to wear, what you want to do. Everything we do in our lives is a decision about how we want to exist. And that is design. And so I do think it's really important for everybody to understand that through the decision-making that we engage in in our lives, we create the life that we want to create. Yeah, I think I think that's really powerful. Thank you, Debbie. And one of the things that I, I think is most interesting, you were an early adopter of podcasting. You know, now your uh, your show, Design Matters, at least at least according to uh, to Wikipedia, it might even be more by now. But it's up to five million downloads per year of your show, uh, which is which is very substantial. Uh, you have been doing this for 18 years. This is before people <laughs> even understood what it, what a podcast was. How was it that you got on the bandwagon so early? Why did you decide that this was something to do? And wh why did you not give up <laughs> when when no one was listening? Because I'm sure in the beginning they were not listening. Well, it's it's quite an accidental journey. It wasn't one that I was intending. It wasn't something that I was thinking I wanted to do from the time I was a little girl. Um, I was running the design division at Sterling Brands. I'd been doing it for many, many years at that point. When I first started working at Sterling, success was something that was um, a, a distant hope and dream. And when I got to Sterling, suddenly um, I was able to achieve some success for the first time in my life. And at that point, I was already well into my 30s when I was almost really at the point of, of giving up, but just had a little bit more, more hope and optimism than I was, I was experience, trying to experience and, and try for. Because I was so enthralled with that early success, at the time, I, I essentially gave up all the things that I wasn't successful at. <laughs> I gave up all of my writing and drawing and illustrating and needlepoint and put my guitar into the bed. I mean, there was just so many things that I stopped doing because I was so enamored with the success. That that's all I wanted all the time. So it was 24-7, sterling and branding and so forth. And in 2004, I was approached by a, a very fledgling internet radio network called Voice America, which is different than Voice of America. And they were interested in my hosting a live internet radio show. And I thought they were offering me a job, but they weren't. They were offering me an opportunity to pay them to produce a podcast. Or not really, there was no podcast then. They were, they were interested in my paying them to produce a live radio show. And at the time, I was so desperate for some other kind of creative outlet that wasn't just about branding and business that I decided to take some of the money that I was earning from this successful business and invest it into this little vanity project, which I ended up getting a great deal of joy from. It was really, really terrible at the beginning. Um, the sound was, was terrible. It was 
really a, a whole new sort of free for all on the internet. And I was doing this little live radio show with two telephone handsets facing my guest in my office at the Empire State Building, which gave me the right to say broadcasting live from the Empire State Building because that's where I worked. So um, those early shows are really quite dreadful. I was um, inspired to upload the digital file of the show by my friend, Brian e. Gomez Palacio, who was the co-founder of a design blog at the time called Speak Up. And the show was live with advertisers, with call-ins, and you had to sort of be tethered to your computer at the time. There was no way to listen to the show when it first started other than being connected to your computer. And so Bryony said, you know, why don't you upload the digital file to iTunes like you're an indie musician? And then I can listen to the show whenever I want. I don't have to be live tethered to the computer when you're doing it once a week. And that's how I decided to upload the, the shows to iTunes inadvertently, making it one of the first podcasts, which then continued after I left Voice America after 100 episodes. That's how I've been delivering the show ever since. That is fantastic. We're here with Debbie Millman. She's the author of the new book. It's called Design Matters. That's also the name of her fantastic podcast. And you can learn more about her and her work at DebbieMillman.com. And Debbie, I want to make sure that we say hi to some of the great folks who are tuning in to join us. We have people from around the world who are here. Cheryl's here from Minneapolis, Ludmilla from SoCal. We've got Rebecca from Chicago. Angelina's tuning in from Mexico. Neri from Paris. Gunel is here from Azerbaijan. We've got Tom. Wow. from Sacramento, Lynn from Washington, Anna is here from Minneapolis, Ali is here from Chad and Huda from Tunisia, Belinda's from Fort Myers, Erzen from Turkey, Beatrice from Brazil, and many more. We're so glad to have you. We're listening to wow. Debbie Millman. Please type your questions for Debbie into the chat box. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. <laughs> so Debbie, I one of the things that, that I was especially interested in, I just wanted to pick up on the theme that you were talking about um, and finally getting the job at Sterling Brands. As, as you know, I write about business and careers. My first book was called Reinventing You. And I know one of the things that's really hard for a lot of people is if it takes a while to be able to break into the field that you really want to break into. I understand it took 12 years from your college graduation to finally being able to land this big job a lot of people would get really frustrated. They might even give up. They might even go in a different direction during that time. But you you have a great quote that I think is quite powerful. You said, it takes work to get the work that you love. Can you talk a little bit about that and how people can perhaps tap into some of that resiliency, even if the traction that they want is not really forthcoming at the moment? Well, I think one of the misnomers about getting work that you love is the idea of getting it. You don't go to a supermarket or a department store and pick out a job like you would pick out a product on a shelf or an outfit on, on a hanger. You earn it. You earn the job and you win the job. And it's extremely competitive and it requires a lot of work and training and failure and rejection and ultimately because I've been asked a, a lot about why I still continue to persevere after all of the rejections and failures over that first 12 years of, of my circuitous career, was that ultimately I think I had just one notch more hope than I had shame about who I was and what I was doing. But I also have to say that my job at Sterling Brands, when I first joined there, it was sort of a, a bit of a Hail Mary with my career. Um, I had started as a designer, wasn't doing particularly well as a designer, then moved into project management, which was a bit of a disaster because I'm not a very organized person, and then finally ended up in sales. And that, to me at the time, felt like the bottom rung of the design business. In fact, what I realized, because I was actually good at that for the first time in my life, I was good at something, that I was making the business happen for all the people that were delivering the business. All the designers and all the project managers were working on the business that I was bringing in. I was the chief rainmaker. And so that really was something that I 
quite by accident realized I was good at. I was good at bringing in business. I don't know if that was because I was so desperate. <laughs> I don't know if it was because I was trying to be such a people pleaser. I don't know if I it was because I ultimately felt like I had a connection to branding from my early, early years in my dad's mom and pop pharmacy that he had as I was growing up. But that power, that power to bring in business that helped shape and grow and develop the business was ultimately why I ended up getting promoted several times and ultimately became a partner in the business that I then owned. Yeah, that's really remarkable. Thank you, Debbie. I love that. We want to say hi to some of our great friends. We have Gilles tuning in from Brussels. Gabriel is from Mexico. We have uh, a friend from San Marcos, Texas. We have Samuel from Qatar. We have I... Ait Ben Hasu from France. We have Karen from Michigan, Vasmi Jahan from Baku, and Victoria from Ukraine. We're so glad to have you and more. We're listening to Debbie Millman, and this is part of our weekly interview show, Better on Newsweek. Debbie Millman is the author of the new book, Design Matters. Now, Debbie, Karen had a question, and she's curious. You're, you are someone who has reinvented yourself many times, in addition to your podcast, um, obviously your career in branding at Sterling Brands, your work at the School of Visual Arts, uh, your art shows that you've done. Karen wants to know, what steps would you recommend in reinventing yourself and staying fresh and relevant? Keep your curiosity front and center in your work and in your life. If you're curious about something, investigate, discover it. If you want to make something, make it. One of the actually great books of our of our time of this moment is Seth Godin's book, The Practice, which is about how to just make work that you want to make without thinking about how the audience is going to respond. If you make work that really speaks to who you are in your heart and is an investigation of things that you are endlessly fascinated by, there's a very strong likelihood that just because of your deep investigation and fascination that other people might be fascinated too. And if you put that kind of work out there, that's really, really based on something that you are passionate about, you will find others that are passionate about it too. If you put work out there to gain an audience, if you put work out there that is strictly to encourage people to like it or follow it, then it might not resonate as much because the generosity of spirit isn't really pure. It's really more about developing a, a growth or an audience than investigating your own personal curiosities. So that would be the, the main thing that I would recommend. I think that's a great point. Thank you. We're here with Debbie Millman. You can learn more about her her book, her current book, Design Matters, as well as her work in general at DebbieMillman.com. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek shows, go to DoryClark.com. You can sign up for a free self-assessment. You'll get reminders about all of this. And so you never miss one of our weekly shows on Thursday. We also want to say hi. Jared's tuning in from Kansas. We have RT from India. Susan from San Diego. Eugenia is from Costa Rica. Robert from Berlin. We have a LinkedIn friend from Basel. Uh, and we have Adnan from Turkey. We're very glad to have all of you. Now, Debbie, something that I'm curious about, I read this, <laughs> I read this on Wikipedia. So I don't actually know if it's true, although I desperately want it to be true. So please tell us. I have read that you for many years had, I guess, a side gig as the creative director at Hot 97 Radio, and that you helped rebrand it from dance music to hip hop. Now, this sounds extremely cool, far cooler than me, who really ha only has expertise in lesbian folk music. So please <laughs> do tell. Is, is, this, is this true? It is true. And what's wrong with lesbian folk music? <laughs> I mean, it, to, it is an excellent genre. I think you have to have the Indigo Girls on the show for absolute sure. Um, and yes, it is true. I, I started working with Hot 97 with the great, great Rocco Macri, who uh, was the uh, promotion manager there. I started working, I think it was 1993. And uh, continued for 12 years to, to do this, um, was part of the team that repositioned the radio station from a dance music radio station to the world's first hip hop and R&B radio station and worked with uh, Sean Combs and Notorious B.I.G. and the Fugees and 
just had an extraordinary, extraordinary experience doing that for the time that I did it. It was now, it's really one of the things I'm proudest of. Hip hop as well? Are you are you really up on on hip hop? I try. I mean, I also have to say that this was one of the things that most impressed my now wife on our first couple of dates. The fact that I did this, and yes, I do have a vast knowledge of vintage hip hop of the OG uh, hip hoppers. Absolutely. That That is both unexpected and amazing. So congratulations, Debbie. I love it. Lorraine's tuning in from San Francisco. Atta from Lome. I actually don't know where Lome is, so I'm going to have to look that up. Welcome, Atta. Uh, this is great. And uh, we have Alejandra from Spain and Julie May from Dublin. We're glad you're here. Now, Debbie, uh, we have a question from Gabriel in Mexico. He says, by design matters, are you talking about des designing strategies to succeed at work and life, et cetera? And I, I happen to have some inside information that over the arc of your show, if I understand correctly, originally it really was mostly talking to designers, but you have broadened the reach vastly and the topics that you talk about in recent years. Can you talk a little bit about that evolution and in fact, how uh, these, these concepts in your view of it apply to succeeding in work and life and more? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this really harkens back to the previous question about pursuing what you're really passionate about. The show started as an accident, really. I was approached by Voice America and did this show about design. And it was very what I now refer to as inside baseball, designers talking about design. And I would say the first 100, 150 episodes are really just like that. And then over time, I started to really feel that what I was really pursuing wasn't so much the discipline of design, but how some of the world's most creative people, most inventive thinkers were designing the arc of their lives and how they were making the decisions to be who they were and how deliberate that was and how hard it could be to overcome obstacles, how people are able to find the courage to do the things that they really want to do when they don't necessarily have any reason to believe that they'll succeed other than just the hope and the desire to make something special with their lives. And that's, and that's ultimately how the arc of the show has changed to really move into how people overcome obstacles, how they overcome resistance, how they persevere in the face of failure and make extraordinary lives, making extraordinary things. Love that. Thank you, Debbie. I think that's really interesting. Now, you have said before, and I will, I will read the quote, that the arc of a creative life is a circuitous one. Can you elaborate on that? What do you, what do you mean by that? And what is the significance of that? What I mean by that is that when you're making creative things, anything creative, you now it could be a podcast, it could be a book, it could be a bed, a meal, whatever, things happen. And any way in which your life is impacted by creativity, your creativity impacts your life. And every day can bring a new discovery about how you make things. And because there's so much magic in the act of creating something from nothing, that it can take you into uncharted territory that you necessarily, that you didn't prepare for. And I think that's one of the most extraordinary things about making something from nothing. You're actually putting something into the world that wasn't there before in your own way, that will never be repeated exactly in the same way again. There's something really remarkable about that. And there's something so unplanned about the result that watching the making and participating in the making, I think, is one of the greatest gifts we have as humans. That's really powerful. I'm Dory Clark. We're here with Debbie Millman, author of the new book, Design Matters. We want to greet some of our great friends tuning in and joining us. Jenny's here from New Hampshire. We have Jacqueline tuning in from Philadelphia and many more. If you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and the share button so that your friends on social media can see it and benefit from Debbie's wisdom as well. Now, Debbie, you were just talking very passionately about the role of creative pursuits. Now, I am curious... You started, you co-founded the Master's of Branding program at SVA, the School of Visual Arts in New York, 
now over a decade ago, 2009, I, from what I know of the world of marketing, the world of branding, in the past decade, one of the biggest changes has been the rise of analytics and data analytics in informing all of these things. I'm curious, I would love to hear some of your thoughts about how the creative ethos of branding coexists with the sort of push toward data and quantification these days. Well, it's a complicated answer because you can look at somebody like Steve Jobs who said that if he was designing for what people thought they wanted, he would never make anything new. Um, you can look back at somebody like Henry Ford, who said that if he'd asked people what they wanted at the turn of the 20th century um, in transportation, they would have said a faster horse and not a car. So I think that data and research and analytics is best understood when thinking about the current moment. What is somebody reacting to? Asking somebody to predict the future that has no idea about where the world is going to go is somewhat dangerous because you're only asking for a specific scenario that they can imagine and invent. If you're an inventor, you want to invent something that's never been made before based on your hopes and dreams about what that future can be. That is true innovation. I think research is best used for directional guidance about how and where and when that can be introduced in a way that people will be able to understand, to be able to create a launch strategy when you already have that new idea, how you can tweak an idea to make it more user-friendly or adaptable to everybody or to be able to iterate on ways in which people can live with this thing. But to create analytics based on developing something that you think will appeal to the to a vast number of people based on their responses is is really just a beauty contest and i i tend to feel that ethnographic research is much more valuable than quantitative research because then you're really understanding how somebody is going to live with something as opposed to how somebody is going to vote on something that's a really fascinating perspective. Thank you for that, Debbie. And I, one of the things that, that I'm curious about, in your new book, Design Matters, you are collecting some of the, the best insights from interviews that you have done over the, the past you know, many years. You have a category of people in the book that you interviewed that you dub truth tellers. And I'm hoping you could tell a, a little bit, what do you mean by that? And would you be able to share with us just one or two insights from these truth tellers that have really stayed with you? Well, what I mean by truth tellers are people that have bared their soul to reveal something that they've experienced that is a very common human experience that people can sometimes either be ashamed of or afraid of or want to hide. And these people have the courage to be able to live in that truth, in that revelation, in a way that isn't just important to them, but is also important to others in terms of their personal growth, their psychological growth, their professional growth. And, and it takes so much courage to do that, that I call that truth telling. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful, Debbie. Thank you. We had a, a great comment come in. I, I love this from, from our friend Adnan. Adnan is in Turkey. He says, you're telling about design like a love poem, but some people just don't get the value and beauty of design. How do you feel about that? What, what do you do when someone just doesn't get it, Debbie? Oh, I don't know that that's really possible. I think that if something is, is beautiful and well-designed, you might be enjoying it and experiencing it without even realizing that it is designed specifically for an intention. I think that if you don't notice the design, likely it's good because that means that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing without interfering in the experience of your doing it. And so I think that that's a really good thing. We don't have to notice all design. Designers can appreciate design. People that are interested in aesthetics can appreciate the aesthetics of something, but you don't have to notice it or even appreciate it to enjoy it. 
And that's one of the great things about design is that the simpler and the, the more effortless something is, likely more thought and energy and design have been put into it. Really interesting point. We're here with Debbie Millman. You can learn more about her work at DebbieMillman.com. And of course, check out her new book. It's called Design Matters. Debbie, a question came in from Julie May, and she's in Dublin. She wants to know, do you think the reliance on big data by, by shareholders uh, is inhibiting the ability of designers to be creative? Do you, do you think that that's kind of getting in people's heads a little too much? I think it depends on how the data is used. As I said, if you have a vast amount of data that's giving you directional guidance on a direction that you should take on an opportunity for you to be able to assess, that's great. If you are using that data to override what your original intention is because you think more people will be interested in it, then you might be pandering to the lowest common denominator as opposed to the highest human purpose. People don't always know what they want. And if you are basing what you give them on what they think they want, you're not giving them the possibility of growing and developing with something new that you're offering for the first time. And so it can be very stifling to base all innovation on getting response from people before you offer the innovation. Really good point. Thank you, Debbie. We're here with Debbie Millman. Uh, a modest request came in from Rebecca in Chicago. She just wants to know, next time, can you please bring Roxanne as well? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's I, right. We were talking about you last night, Dory, and how much we like you and, and how amazing you are and how wonderful your newsletter is and just how generous you are. And so absolutely, I will ask her to come back and you can talk to her on your own if you want. I love it. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sure that would please Rebecca as well. So Debbie, a, a great question came in here from Ludmilla. Ludmilla is a professor in Southern California. I think this is probably on her mind because she's writing a lot. And of course, you have just finished your book, Design Matters. Ludmilla wants to know, how do we apply design thinking if, if you're actually writing a book? Is there a way to apply it to the book writing process? Well, again, I believe that design is intention making. What is the intention for your book? What is the reason for being? And so I think you have to think of a couple of things. You have to think about what it is you want to offer. What is the benefit of doing this book? And once you can determine that, you can create an arc to be able to help form what it is you're making so that people will be able to receive that benefit in, in the most positive and, and generous way. Also outline what your criteria for success is. Sometimes we do things without really understanding what the end game is, what the end goal is. And sometimes it's really important to have that really in, in, in our front facing mirror here to be able to understand what we want to bring into the world and what will make us happy in the doing of that. And so looking at the internal perspective, you know, what, why am I doing this? What is the reason for being for this book, this painting, this illustration, this car, whatever it is we're making? And then what is the benefit that we're going to be able to embed in this thing so that when we offer it to the world, it's really providing a purpose for people and it allows them to engage with this work in a very, very different way than if it's just internally driven. I hope that's helpful. Really good advice. We're here with Debbie Millman. We have time for probably just one more speed round question. Debbie is the author of the new book, Design Matters. You can learn more about her. Check out her book and her other work at DebbieMillman.com. We want to say hi to Paolo from, from Sao Paulo in Beth Zaida from Panama joining us. So many wonderful friends from it's around incredible. the world. incredible. This is incredible, Dory. What a, what a community you have created. Oh, thank you so much. It's wonderful, folks. And if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like and share button so your friends from around the world can benefit from Debbie's wisdom as well. Debbie, the last question that I have for you. This is a, a special moment now where in many ways the barriers to developing creative work, having a creative career are lower than ever. People can do things. And yet, of course, the necessary corollary is that the level of noise is really high and it's hard to get heard. It's hard to get your ideas uh, noticed and heard out there. What would be your advice for someone who is trying to build a creative career for themselves 
and uh, just feels like, oh my goodness, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. What should I do? Keep doing it. Everything worthwhile takes time. We unfortunately live in a world now where that speed to success is something that people are, are really um, obsessed by. As, as you mentioned, I didn't really even get the first job I was ever successful at until 12 years into my career. And I've been doing the podcast now for 17 years. Anything worthwhile takes time. And it does take work to get the work you love. And if it was easy, it would be easy. You know, nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. No job is easy. Even dream jobs are not easy. Sometimes they're harder than the crappy jobs. As a result, do what you want to do and put your whole heart in doing it. And don't stop until you get what you love. Because the only way you're not going to achieve it is if you stop. If you keep working, if you keep iterating, if you keep evolving, eventually you will come upon what it is you were meant to do. But you can't give up. And you can't expect it to take a month or six months or a year or two years or five years. Do it for 10 years and then let's talk. I love it. Do it for 10 years and then let's talk. We've been here with Debbie Millman. She's the author of Design Matters. Learn more at DebbieMillman.com. This is our weekly Newsweek series, Better. It's every Thursday, noon, Eastern, 9 Pacific. Debbie Millman, thank you so much for joining us. It has been my honor, Dory. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us and see you next week.